Hi, welcome back to the channel and Happy New Year to you all. And today we're going to be looking at these little project kits. So what this is, is a little high voltage inverter PCB. So if you have a little look on eBay, I'm not sure exactly which seller I bought it from, uh, but they all look to be very similar. What you get is the PCB, some components and a transformer. And the idea is that you put in something like 3.7 volts from a lithium cell and you get up to 15,000 volts at the output of the transformer. And what I want to do with these kits is to build a very primitive ESD gun. So the idea is that rather than designing the whole circuit from scratch, I wanted something that was very simple. So hopefully what we'll be able to do is get 15,000 volts out from this transformer, feed it into a capacitor that represents the capacitance of the human body, and then be able to discharge it into our uh, equipment that we want to test. So I thought what we'd do today is just have a little look at these kits and see if they work okay for our uh, application. And the schematic is extremely straightforward. It's basically what we've got on the screen just here. So we've got one winding that is actually driving power into the transformer. We've got a feedback winding that is basically looking for the changing magnetic flux and that provides some feedback to the base to turn it on and off. And then we've got one additional winding, which is our high voltage winding. And in this case, we should have quite a high turns ratio. And in this schematic, they've illustrated this transistor as an NPN type. There's no actual markings on the transistor itself, but we can stick it in the transistor tester and just verify that's what it is. And yeah, that's coming out with an NPN with a gain of about 230 or something like that. So very similar to a BD139 or something like that. So the transformer itself has a ferrite core, so it's designed for high frequency use. On the left here, we've got two sets of windings. So we've got a feedback winding and the main primary winding wound together around the core. And we've probably got about four layers in total and about 20 windings on each layer. So if those are roughly one to one, then there's probably about 40 turns for each winding. And then on the right hand side, we've got the HV winding. And you can see this is extremely fine gauge enameled copper wire wound onto this former. And they've just melted the former very slightly just to hold these wires in place where they've soldered it on. And they've got these little brakes here to try and reduce the chance of any flashover from each end of the coil. But it's fairly simple in construction, it's just been held together with a little bit of sticky tape here, so pretty cheap in terms of construction. But it might be worth just seeing what the inductances look like for each of the windings, and then we can see if we can estimate what the turns ratio actually is. So to start off with, we'll just measure the HV winding, and that's reading about 760 millihenries, and that's at a test frequency of 10 kilohertz. If we increase that a little bit, 20 kilohertz, it's still reading pretty much the same. 50 kilohertz, still very similar. When we go up to 100 kilohertz, it starts dropping off. So that's the core no longer working very well at that frequency. So I think it's fairly safe to say that that original reading was approximately correct. Next, we'll have a look at the primary winding. And that's reading about 60 microhenries. And similarly, if we change the frequency, it's pretty consistent until we get to 100 kilohertz where it starts changing. Finally, we've got the feedback winding and that reads about 87 microhenries. So I've just remeasured the readings and scribbled them down this time. They're probably very slightly different, but what we can do is we can estimate the turns ratio based on the square root of the inductance of any two windings. So in the case of the primary to the feedback winding, we can see that the turns ratio is about 1.2. Oddly, between the primary and the secondary, we're only getting 111. So if we've got our 3.7 volts going in, that's only given us an output voltage of about 410 volts, which clearly isn't correct. So I'm a little bit puzzled about what's going on here. This is, you know, basic transformer rules. So there shouldn't be any error in terms of the calculations. I've tested the inductances on the other LCR meters that I've got in the lab and they correspond to this. So I'm a little bit puzzled about what's going on here. And if we have a little look at the transformer itself, you know, if I said there's 20 turns on here, 
that would mean there's about 2,200 turns in total. And it's pretty difficult to estimate. I mean, looking up closely, there's probably about 200 to 300 turns in each section, which lines up. So what I'm going to do is, when this is up and running, I might have a little look at what the waveforms look like and see if they're using some kind of inductor action, you know, using a very harsh square wave rather than the sine wave that we'd normally use on a transformer like this. But I'll have a little look at that later on in the video. And if you've got any ideas, then obviously post them in the comments down below. So there's not really too much in the way of assembly instructions, but everything is marked on the PCB. So hopefully uh, the construction should be fairly straightforward. There's only a few components, so we've got the diode here. The 120 ohm resistor. Just trim those to length before soldering so we don't fracture any solder joints. Now the input specs for this are I think 3.7 volts at about 2 amps or so. So we probably need a bit of thermal compound on the back of the transistor because I think we're going to be dissipating quite a bit of power in this transistor, hence the heatsink. And the heatsink itself is threaded so we should just be able to screw this screw through the transistor and straight in. So we'll do the final Titan once it's in the PCB because it wants to slip round. And this just slides in. And the heatsink itself also solders into the board. So you probably need a reasonably powered soldering station to solder this in place. Now this is probably the only part of the assembly where something might go wrong. You can see we've got four lines here, so thin, thin, thick and thick. And if we have a little look at the transformer as well, we've got two thin windings and two thick windings. So it's quite clear that these two bottom ones are for the primary winding and the two top ones are for the feedback. But if we get the phasing incorrect, then we won't get the oscillation that we need. But if we lay this on the PCB like this, it makes the most sense that these two uh, the thick and the thin are joined together to go into the centre hole and then this one naturally falls at the bottom. So that's what we're going to go with and we do need to roughen up the enamel coating on the windings just so that we can solder it in to the PCB. Now it doesn't come with a terminal block for the power but we may as well add one in. That gives us a little bit more flexibility at a later date. We'll just solder that in. Right, so I've just got a bit of blue tack holding the wires in place and I've just connected it up to a cheap Chinese power supply. I didn't want this damaging one of my expensive TTI power supplies if something's wrong. But we should be able to turn up the voltage. And we can hear it whining at 1.2 volts. And yeah, we are actually getting an output and a bit of smoke because the wires are getting hot. So let's take a little look at what happens when we start to put some voltage onto the primary. Let's start at something low at about 1 volt or so, just where it's starting to oscillate. And you can see here that we are not getting a standard sine wave that you'd expect into a traditional transformer. This is a very short pulse, about 4 microseconds at the moment in duration. And the frequency is about 8.5 kilohertz, so very close to what we were measuring the inductance at with the LCR meter. So that gives us a good indication that we we're getting real readings in terms of the inductance on the LCR meter. If we increase the voltage further, so here we are about 3.7 volts. Let's uh, stop the waveform and just turn it off so we don't have the high pitch. So it looks like the very short duration of the pulse here is creating a very rapid change in magnetic flux in the coil. And as we know, if we've got a very rapid change in magnetic flux, we're able to generate extremely high voltages. So an example would be on a boost converter, for example, where that voltage is only limited by the current being drawn and the feedback circuit that's implemented around it. So that's why the turns ratio calculations don't quite work out as we'd expect because we're not driving it like a standard transformer, we're using much more of the inductor action to generate the high voltage on the output. So we know the breakdown of air is roughly 3 kV per millimetre, and therefore if we have a gap of 5 millimetres and the arc is able to jump across it, 
then we know we're achieving our 15 kV. So I'll just turn down the lab lights a bit. And if I start increasing the input voltage, at about 3.7 volts, we're getting quite a steady discharge across those two terminals. So we're clearly achieving our 15 kV. And with a standard lithium battery, we'll be able to get our 15 kV into our human body model for electrostatic discharge. And if we have a little look at this website here, basically all we need is the high voltage supply, which is our 15 kV here. We'll need a diode on the output that's capable of withstanding 15 kV, but it just needs to charge up a 100 picofarad capacitor. And then we discharge into our device under test through a 1.5k resistor. So I'm gonna source a few components that are able to withstand the high voltage, but the circuit really should be very simple. Ideally, just want to be able to pulse this generator on and off very quickly, just to charge up that 100 picofarad capacitor, and then uh, we'll be able to discharge that 100 picofarad capacitor into our device under test. So really quite a straightforward uh, little piece of kit. So I think that's about all I actually wanted to cover in this video. I just wanted to check that this device would actually do what I need it to be able to do. Now the only problem is that this isn't a regulated high voltage output. So either I need to tabulate some results to work out exactly what output voltage we get based on the input voltage. Maybe we could add in a HV voltmeter. So something where we've just got a string of high impedance resistors and we can measure the voltage there. But basically, this design should be very straightforward. This is going to bolt onto the PCB, and then the PCB itself will be quite long with a probe on the end that's connected to our 100 picofarad capacitor. And we'll just have a button where we can pulse this on and off just to charge up that capacitor. And I think that's about all there is that I need it to be able to do to do the kind of testing that I actually want to achieve in the lab. So hopefully, you found the video useful. And until next time, thanks for watching.